American writer Stephen Crane said, nothing better exists. That story contains everything. And it really does. Stream of consciousness, irony, symbolism, and practically seamless narrative shifts from a limited third person narrator to first person. It's a story about an execution, an alleged trick, a hallucination or wishful thinking, the need for human connection and an in-depth psychological examination of what a man goes through in the mere seconds before his death. And it's about how we, the readers, mislead ourselves. The narrator in this story doesn't necessarily fool us. He gives us the clues we need to stay on track. So did you stay on track or were you a bit shocked by Peyton Farquhar's lifeless body swaying gently underneath the Owl Creek Bridge? Bierce's story reminds us that reading is not a passive act. As a reader, you have responsibilities to ingest, question, consider, and examine what's being presented, how the story is told, and why. In fact, Bierce himself detested, quote, bad readers, readers who, lacking the habit of analysis, lack the faculty of discrimination, and take whatever is put before them with the broad, blind, catholicity of a slop-fed conscience of a parlor pig, end quote. So ask yourself, what sort of emotional response might you have to a story that could alter how you perceive it? This question is important because I would argue that 99% of readers identify with and root for Peyton Farquhar and so are shocked when he never escapes his execution at all, despite the fact that the narrator gives us many clues to indicate that an escape was never possible in the first place. Hey guys, I'm Dr. Whitney Costers, professor of English, and I've spent my entire professional career studying and researching literature. So if you need a helpful resource on classic literature and writing, then this is the place for you. So please take a second to subscribe to my channel and hit the notification bell so that you can be updated on the weekly lectures that I post here. An occurrence at Owl Creek Bridge takes place in Alabama, a southern state, during the American Civil War, and it's divided into three parts. Part one introduces us to the scene of the execution. We don't yet know Peyton Farquhar by name. He is simply a man standing on a railroad bridge with his wrist bound and a rope tied around his neck, and he wishes that he were free. Here we learn the logistics of the layout, who is there, and how when one soldier steps off the plank upon which he's standing, it will raise up and release the prisoner to his death. It's also in part one that the man is executed as the last line is, the sergeant stepped aside. Part two turns the nameless man into a human. It's in this section that we learn that this is Peyton Farquhar, a 35-year-old well-to-do Southern planter and slave owner from a highly respected Alabama family. He's married with children. For reasons deliberately unmentioned, Farquhar is not enlisted in the Confederate Army, but he's ardently devoted to the Confederate cause. And because his only understanding of war resides strictly in his imagination, he has romanticized and glorified war. Farquhar is an idealist, a romantic, and a wannabe war hero who has been waiting for his opportunity for distinction. His name actually means both brave man of noble descent and gray clad man. And you'll notice that there is a lot of the color gray in this story. It's said that no service was too humble for him to perform in the aid of the South. No adventure too perilous for him to undertake if consistent with the character of a civilian who was at heart a soldier. Now, this is crucial information that the reader must remember because it informs the way Farquhar interprets the soldier's information about the bridge and how he handles the grim reality of his hanging. It's in part two that we also learn how Farquhar ended up with a rope around his neck. While relaxing with his wife on a bench at the entrance of his grounds one evening, a federal scout, a northerner, dressed as a Confederate, approaches Farquhar requesting water. While Mrs. Farquhar gets the water, the disguised northerner tells Farquhar that Union soldiers are repairing the railroads, have taken control over the Owl Creek Bridge, are getting ready to attack, and that any civilian who interferes with the railroad, its bridges, tunnels, or trains will be summarily hanged. To Farquhar, this information is his opportunity for distinction that he's been waiting for because in the later part of the Civil War, the Union and the Confederacy fought for control of the rail lines in Northern Alabama. The Confederates in particular needed control to slow the Northerners' advance and supply lines. So Farquhar, longing for the larger life of the soldier, asks if anything can be done about the situation, to which the soldier says, well, near the bridge, there's a lot of really dry wood that would burn easily. And then off the soldier goes. Part three covers Farquhar's death and the disorientation his brain and body endure in the short process. 
Farquhar believes he falls into the water, releases himself from his restraints, avoids the bullets and cannons that whiz past him, eludes the Union soldiers, runs all night through unfamiliar terrains, and makes it back to his home and wife, only for his neck to finally break the moment he reaches out to embrace his wife. And the narrator dryly and ironically says, Peyton Farquhar was dead. His body, with a broken neck, swung gently from side to side beneath the timbers of the Owl Creek Bridge. So how did we get here? Some readers feel frustrated or angry because they feel like they got tricked. But as I mentioned earlier, does the narrator really trick you or did you allow yourself to be duped? How did you feel about Farquhar? Was he a hero to you, a devoted man to his family and cause, a victim of trickery and deception, a war hero? Or is he a man who sits aside as a war rages on, a self-inflated figure who glorifies himself, war, and even his own execution? The narrator makes a point to tell us that Farquhar, a well and able young man, longs for the larger life of the soldier, yet remains unlisted in the army. It's suggested that being one of the thousands under the command of another is not heroic enough for Farquhar. It doesn't afford him that opportunity for distinction that he's been awaiting. You should know that the author, Ambrose Bierce, fought in some of the bloodiest battles in the Civil War. He saw the destruction and reality of it. He himself was shot in the head, and he even participated in three military executions. In other words, to Bierce, Farquhar is a cowardly, naive, wannabe war hero whose dramatic illusions are starkly contrast with and terminated by brutal reality. I think Bierce employs a lot of subtle irony throughout the story to show this contrast, and it's easy to miss if you've chosen to sympathize with Farquhar and follow him down his path of glory. And this is too easy to do. For one thing, Bierce employs the narrative technique stream of consciousness to tell parts of the story. If you're not familiar with this technique, it's one that attempts to mimic the natural and sometimes chaotic process by which we think. This can be disorienting to read at times because humans think much differently than they speak or write. When we think, we just think. We don't necessarily think linearly or in chronological order with proper punctuation and transitions, and we may jump from one unrelated topic to the next. So not only are we in the mind of a character, we're in the mind of a man whose body and brain are literally trying to survive, endure excruciating pain, struggle to exist, self-preserve, and recapture an entire lifetime of memories in a mere few seconds. And remember, Farquhar has built his dreams of war on this grandiose belief that he is at heart a soldier and that no adventure is too perilous for him to undertake. So this hallucination he experiences is exactly what someone like Farquhar's brain would undertake. Think about the impossibilities of it all. For one thing, the narrator tells us that something in the awful disturbance of his organic system had so exalted and refined them that they made record of things never before perceived. So here's the narrator dangling a clue before us. He tells us that these things that Farquhar experiences have never been experienced before by anyone or anything. So let's make a list of some of the impossibilities of the things that Farquhar can now perceive. He feels the ripples upon his face and can hear their separate sounds as they struck. As he looks at the forest on the bank of the stream, he can not only see the individual trees, but also the leaves and the veining of each leaf. He can see the very insects upon them, the locusts, the brilliant bodied flies, the gray spiders stretching their webs from twig to twig. He can even see the prismatic colors in all the dewdrops upon a million blades of grass. I mean, what? He hears the humming of the gnats that dance above the eddies of the stream, the beating of the dragonfly's wings, the strokes of the water spider's legs, and he can hear the rush of a fish's body that moves past him. Now keep in mind that most of these things are impossible in and of themselves, but don't forget that Farquhar's body is floundering in the rushing water as he tries to remove the rope from his neck and the cords that bind his hands. And he's gasping for air since he's been plunged down into water and because a rope has been strangling him. And we're told that the water roared in his ears like the voice of Niagara. Furthermore, he can see the color of a soldier's eye, a soldier who stands far away from him on the bridge. And the narrator reminds us once more that Farquhar is inexperienced. He is no soldier, and yet he's managed to survive a hanging and a drowning. 
He's managed to somehow remove his restraints, outrun and outswim not only the experienced soldiers, but their variety of bullets and cannons that they shoot at this one open vulnerable target. One bullet does actually hit him between the collar and neck, but Farquhar just snatches it out and keeps diving down below. Simply over his shoulder, remember as he's swimming vigorously with the current, Farquhar is somehow able to see the soldiers reloading, drawing their weapons, and firing again. And if you read what Farquhar tells himself, it reads like the way a young boy who's playing pretend narrates his own heroic deeds, victory, and escape. They will not do that again, he thought. The next time they will use a charge of grape. I must keep my eye upon the gun. The smoke will apprise me. The report arrives too late. It lags behind the missile. This is a good gun. And then once he gets out of the water, look at how the setting is described. It's said that the forest seemed interminable. Nowhere did he discover a break in it, not even a woodman's road. He had not known that he lived in so wild a region. There was something uncanny in the revelation. Then he finds himself on a strange road, a road that is untraveled and is surrounded by nothing. It's described as though this road has never existed. And Farquhar sees great golden stars and strange constellations and hears whispers in an unknown tongue. This story has an eerie horror element to it with its spooky black bodies of trees flanking him, the distinct whispers of unintelligible words that float around in a space untraveled and uninhabited by anyone or anything. And Farquhar's superhuman or supernatural ability to hear and see things normally unheard and unseen, at least in his position, is chilling, strange, and weird. It's even said that he could no longer feel the roadway beneath his feet as though he's floating. If you look at everything that's being told to us by both the narrator and Farquhar's confused thoughts, we as rational humans know that this simply can't be. We're not in a supernatural tale, but most of us adopt Farquhar's heroic and romantic illusions and accept the adventure and treat it as dramatically as he does. And one reason we do this is because of the way the narrative moves back and forth from limited third person narration to Farquhar's first person narration. Remember that third-person limited narration means that an outsider looking in is telling us information about the setting, characters, and plot, but because he's not omniscient, meaning because he doesn't know everything, he can only tell us what he does know. And when you read the story, you'll notice that the narrator uses a lot of language that's suggestive and conditional. He says things like, the man who was engaged in being hanged was apparently about 35 years of age or a sergeant who in civil life may have been a deputy sheriff directed to private soldiers. And the word seemed, for instance, appears nine times in the story. For instance, the beginning of part three says, as Peyton Farquhar fell straight downward through the bridge, he lost consciousness and was as one already dead. From this state, he was awakened ages later, it seemed to him by the pain of a sharp pressure upon his throat. Note that the narrator pretty much just told us that Farquhar is good as dead, but it seems to Farquhar that he's awakened. And it's then that his adventure, his hallucination begins. You can either follow him or take a step back and read through the lines. Let me show you how and why it's so easy to get caught up with Farquhar's fantasy, despite having all the reasons that I mentioned earlier not to fall for it. Let's take this portion of the story for our example. He looked a moment as his unsteadfast footing, then let his gaze wander to the swirling water of the stream racing madly beneath his feet. A piece of dancing driftwood caught his attention and his eyes followed it down the current. How slowly it appeared to move. What a sluggish stream. Did you see where the third person narration stopped and the first person narration began? The first person narration began with how slowly it appeared to move. And these shifts happen throughout the story. So sometimes when you think you're listening to an objective third-person narrator, you're really in the midst of Farquhar's deluded fantasies. Furthermore, if we continue to look at this quote, note that while waiting to be executed, Farquhar gazes at the swirling water of the stream racing madly beneath his feet. And later, the pain that he feels after he falls through the bridge shoots through his body and is described as streams of pulsating fire heating him to an intolerable temperature a descriptive word that connects him with the water beneath the bridge. 
And then once Farquhar believes he's in the water, it's said that a counter swirl had caught him and turned him half round. So a couple of things are happening here. The water is swirling, but Farquhar is never in it. His brain begins to incorporate and reinterpret the reality of his hanging and death into a fantasy of heroism and escape. So instead of understanding that Farquhar's body is literally swirling around on the rope from which his neck hangs, the traumatized brain reimagines it as part of a dramatic environment from which Farquhar must escape. And we as readers have been given some reason to make connections between Farquhar and water and its swirling motion. So we give less credence to the physics of a recently hanged body and are more apt to believe he's caught in some sort of current. The story considers the trauma that the body goes through in the middle of death, and it suggests that no matter how swift or quick death is in reality, there is always suffering. Farquhar's life begins to flash before his eyes in mere seconds, but even though the reality of time is seconds or maybe a few minutes, time becomes far more concentrated and slower as his brain desperately kicks into overtime, trying to be, do, experience, fulfill, remember everything, all while still grasping onto life, struggling to survive, enduring the physical and emotional trauma and pain, and sorting through his own disorientation. Ironically, when Farquhar comes out of the water, it's said that he felt his head emerge. His eyes were blinded by the sunlight, his chest expanded convulsively, and with a supreme and crowning agony, his lungs engulfed a great drought of air, which instantly he expelled in a shriek. Such imagery is consistent with the birth of a baby, symbolic perhaps of the emergence or birth of the realities of war to Farquhar's disillusioned brain that continues to hold on to the fantasy that he can escape, outsmart, and triumph over these soldiers who have not only caught him, but have full-on executed him. It's worth pointing out the ironic, dry, and extremely concise way the narrator ends every section of the story, all of which follow and undercut the dramatic fantasies of Farquhar. In part one, Farquhar uncloses his eyes and again he sees the water below him and thinks, if I could free my hands, I could throw off the noose and spring into the stream. By diving, I could evade the bullets and swimming vigorously, reach the bank, take to the woods and get away home. My home, thank God, is as yet outside their lines. My wife and little ones are still beyond the invader's farthest advance. And all the narrator has to say at the end is the sergeant stepped aside. And of course, this is the sergeant whose footing was the only thing holding Farquhar safely on the bridge. In part two, Farquhar, dreaming of his adventure, says to the disguised Confederate soldier, suppose a man, a civilian and student of hanging, should elude the picket post and perhaps get the better of the sentinel. What could he accomplish? And following this deluded dream, the narrator simply says of the soldier, he was a federal scout. And then, of course, in part three, after watching Farquhar run to his wife and then feel a stunning blow upon his neck, followed by a blinding white light, the narrator ironically says, Peyton Farquhar was dead. His body, with a broken neck, swung gently from side to side beneath the timbers of the Owl Creek Bridge. And with every basic objective statement, the reader is forced to see that we were just as mistaken, just as dramatic, just as naively hopeful as Peyton Farquhar. Share with me your experience with the story, what your first time reading it was like, and how you will approach the story the next time now that you have all of this information. As always, thank you for joining me and please check out some of my other videos on lectures on authors like Chopin, Atwood, Orwell, and Poe. I hope to see you guys there.